Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. This week's video, we are discussing six reasons why you might not want to be a flight medic. So flight medicine is generally considered the pinnacle of pre-hospital medicine. A lot of new grad nurses and paramedics come out of school with the goal of becoming a flight critical care provider on a helicopter somewhere in the United States. And I think that's great. That was one of my goals. And I've been working as a flight paramedic for the last uh, three-ish years, a little bit under three years. And I love it. However, this job is not for everyone. And I believe, as I've said in other videos, of being completely honest with people because it doesn't do any good to like glorify everything we do, push people in directions that they might not be ready for, they might not want, and then have them be miserable in that whole process and seek other careers. So I would rather just be upfront with some of the issues and some of the reasons why this job might not be for you. Obviously, this is going to change uh, region to region. Some of these things I'm going to list today are things that apply to me, others that don't apply to me or my base. So obviously, you have to take some of it with a grain of salt, and I am speaking in generalities, so that doesn't mean that this base over here doesn't have this issue or has this issue. Just keep that in mind as you watch the video. So getting into it without further ado, number one, and something that I feel like is just not talked about. Uh, before you're hired into flights is motion sickness. Now, this is going to really affect some people. It's going to not affect others at all. Like if you're somebody that can just close their eyes on a spiraling airplane going down and you're completely fine, uh, it's probably not going to be an issue for you. Uh, however, a lot of us kind of sit somewhere in the middle where we don't get motion sick super easily uh, in our everyday life. We're not getting like crazy car sick or anything. But with the right impetus, we uh, can get there. So motion sickness is actually a huge deal in flights. And it's something that I experience periodically to the point where I'm now wearing a uh, TheraBand on the aircraft for those nights where you're under night vision goggles and you're circling for you know an hour waiting to be uh, landed on the scene, something like that. I, I just had to find something to make me a little bit more comfortable. And it's not totally uncommon for somebody to quit while they're in orientation when they get in the aircraft and discover that they actually get really, really sick. There's not a great way to predict this. You know, some people are really sick on commercial airlines and then they get on the helicopter and are completely fine. And sometimes they're completely fine on commercial airlines and gets on the helicopter and uh, just can't handle it. So generally speaking, you can work through it. Just know that it's something that a lot of us experience pretty regularly on the job. There are days where you go in and take a really long flight, especially for us in the mountains, and you just get really sick and you're just, all you want to do is get on the ground. And then for the rest of the day, you just feel a little bit woozy on your feet. Now we can work through it. You know, it's not the biggest deal ever, but it is this kind of constant potential for discomfort. And like I said earlier, where it really gets bad is on really gusty days, or if you fly in a region with lots of mountains, like we do out here, and then you're under night vision goggles and you're circling those night vision goggles, even though it's technically no magnification, they still have a little bit of distortion and it's kind of a recipe for um, uh, getting a little bit more sick. Now, we have had staff members in the past uh, paint the side of the helicopter with vomit. That's relatively uncommon, um, but a lot of us will feel bad on a regular basis. So keep that in mind going into it that you could get uncomfortable and if you're unsure, charter a helicopter tour or something and just see how you feel there. For me, it's completely random when it happens. Like some days I'm great and other days I'm not, which is why I've kind of taken my own precautions uh, with the TheraBand. All right, moving on from that, number two, we have to talk about weather and temperature extremes one way or another. Now I get it, like this isn't going to be everybody. Uh, I function out in Colorado, so we get the extreme heat and we get the extreme cold, especially up in the mountains on some of our scene flights. And this is something that like you wouldn't think it would be that much different than ground EMS because you know you're kind of used to dealing with bad weather on the ground. But with helicopters, it is very hard to load patients. It takes time. Now we fly out of A stars, so 
it takes a lot of time for us to load patients simply because we don't have much space. But even in the larger airframes, the 135s, 145s, uh, 429s, all of those aircraft are still a pain to load your patients, which means that you're going to be in the elements more. This is a much bigger deal in the winter because you oftentimes have patients with a ton of drips. They've got a lot of stuff going on. And if you're not cognizant of your IV lines, they can freeze. You're freezing yourself. It's kind of hard to to dress in a sensible manner for the helicopter because you go from, you know, comfort or even heat in the helicopter to freezing cold. And then you have to function in that for, you know, an hour or so and then get back in the helicopter. So with that, like we've had uh, ventilator tubing snap because it's been so cold. We've frozen our IV lines, which is actually a pretty big deal if that happens, especially if they're getting like sedation or a presser of some kind that's supporting their blood pressure. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. So that that's one side of it, the really cold spectrum. On the hot side of things, now granted, once again, this is different place to place and it's different airframe to airframe. But for us, when it's really hot, when it's 100 degrees out, our helicopter's AC works really good if it's 70 degrees outside. So basically, it works well when it's not needed. Once you start getting temperatures above 80 degrees, the cabin temperature can get very, very uncomfortable. And we can mitigate that with the patient. We can kind of open a window and vent it right on them. But for a crew, there's not a whole lot we can do. And we have our big bulky helmets on. We have... Um, our flight suits, which are not breathable at all, they're supposed to be fire resistant. So of course they're not going to be, you know, crazy, uh, uh, comfortable in extremes of temperature. And I can remember one time we were flying to, uh, pick this patient up and our cabin temps were at 107 degrees and we're just sweating through everything we have. And now you're taking care of a patient in front of you. You're uh, trying to do care, your head's down, and it kind of goes back to that sickness part of it. You've got motion, and it can be very uncomfortable uh, on the heat side of things. One of our uh, competitive agencies in the state, they do a lot of in-mountain work, way more than we do, and they don't even fly with air conditioners because it's more weight. So they will open a window if they need to cool down a little bit and fly at higher altitudes if they need to but they don't even have any kind of AC unit in that helicopter to cool them down. So it can be very uncomfortable depending on the weather. And it's just a little bit more extreme than it is in the 911 setting, in my experience at least. And I do you know, have about 10 years on a ground ambulance to kind of give that opinion. Uh, some people might disagree with me. You can leave it in the comments down below and we can fight about it later. So number three, IFT versus 911. And I hear this from people all the time where they, they kind of like, well, man, if I want to do IFT, I just join AMR and that's all you guys do on flights. And that's actually, there is truth to that. It's not totally true, but there is some truth to that. Uh, generally speaking, in my experience, uh, the average is about two thirds in our facility transport, one third scene flight. And that's true for my base. That's true for a lot of bases across the US. You know, some will have different ratios. Some are running exclusively IFTs, especially these pediatric specialty teams. Uh, some are running almost exclusively 911. But generally speaking, these flight services are going to run a majority IFT with 911 scene flights uh, sprinkled in. What I want to make clear about this is that these interfacility transports are not what most people are used to on the ground for IFTs. You know, the grammar return home, um, the, you know, oh, they're on like one drip, they're going down to a hospital. We certainly do like the really sit and stairs, we call them, where there's like one thing going and we, we look at them going down there. But for the most part, the interfacility transports we do are very, very sick patients that have a lot going on. So it's a different kind of medicine than uh, 911 ambulance is doing, you know, you're not always starting from scratch and trying to do all these things, but maintaining care and optimizing that patient is a huge part of what we do. And a lot of times we are flying to these rural facilities that aren't used to seeing these sick patients. And we end up kind of having to fix everything that was done. So we call them four wall scene calls where we are very busy. We're pushing meds. We're, uh, doing invasive procedures. I tell people all the time that I get way more rapid sequence intubations out of inner facility transports than I do on our scene flights. Uh, and I think that's true pretty much across the board where you've got these sick patients that you need to manage. If you don't like ICU medicine, if you don't like what 
is in our job description, like critical care, which is, you know, balloon pumps, impellas, you know, ECMO patients. We take those by ground. We don't take those by air. Um, you know, your BiPAP, your ventilators, your multiple drips, you know, all of that going on. If you don't like that, you're probably not going to like flights. I think it's a great challenge. It's really cool to see a different side of medicine uh, outside of what I'm used to in EMS, but that might not be for everybody. So just be aware that a lot of what you're doing is flying hospital to hospital. And I will say that the the allure of being on a helicopter does fade. So I still think it's super cool. I still love being on a helicopter, but you know, it, it's really, really cool. And every flight you do is cool right at first, but you kind of discover over the course of like six months to a year that a helicopter is just a vehicle and it becomes pretty commonplace. So don't think that being cool in a helicopter is just going to sustain you through your career. You actually have to like the medicine and you should be aware of what you're going to be doing. This is stuff that you can ask uh, any base you're interviewing at, like how many IFTs have seen flights they do, and they should be able to answer that question pretty well in that interview. All right. Number four is going to be job instability. Now, this isn't an issue for me. I work for a university program. We've got a built-in customer base with a, a health program across the state. So we fly a lot. Like I think we flew almost 600 patients last year, which for a helicopter uh, is a lot of patients. Um, but for a lot of people, bases can open and close at a moment's notice. I think a good example of this is like the air method bases over the last uh, year. My old partner moved out to Hawaii for her husband and she got a job as a flight nurse on a fixed wing in Hawaii. And she showed up to work one day and air methods announced that they were closing all their bases and they had two weeks to reapply somewhere else in the program. That is not an uncommon occurrence, especially for community-based programs that aren't tied into a larger health system. Whether you agree with it or not, a lot of flight services, such as Air Methods, are profit-based in the United States, and they might not balance bill. It might not be like a totally like unethical operation or anything, but uh, they still have to fly minimum numbers. They still have to get reimbursements, and that means that they are very quick to shut down bases if they're not meeting their numbers of patients to transport. So there is a lot of movement in this industry. Uh, on my side of the fence, you know, we moved into some regions um, that the health system that I work for wanted to uh, control the transports a little bit more. And we pushed out several bases where those people had to be relocated to new locations in the state. I don't think anybody lost their job in that, but they did have to move around. So just be aware that this isn't uh, with some exceptions, it can be a lot more uh, unstable than your kind of quintessential municipal EMS agency. I will say anybody coming from, you know, a private service in, I don't know, like, say, California, where contracts are always being negotiated, it's probably still more stable than that. So I'm not saying you're just going to get this job and lose your job right away and you always have to be scared, but it's not as safe as a municipal service. Number five is logistical complications. Uh, and this is really hard to like put into words and to quantify, but when you get into a helicopter, everything is more logistically challenging. Uh, everything takes more time, maybe not for the patient transport leg of it, but you know, just because you have a short flight doesn't mean you're just going to be out of bed for a short period of time and then go right back there like you would in a 911 ambulance with an inner city transport. For flights, you have all sorts of things that have to happen. You have your, your flight planning, you launch, you go to the scene, you stabilize the patient, you pick them up, you transport them back to the hospital, you have to put your helicopter back together. We have to fly back to an airport, fuel, then fly back to the helipad, set down, tie the helicopter down if it's uh, nighttime or it's windy. We have to put covers on depending on that because we don't have a hangar at our uh, the hospital we're based at. And it just takes a long time. Minimum uh, for any length of flight, we are going to be up for three hours. And when you get longer, more complicated flights, it's going to be even longer. That's not even counting the charting requirements. So 
our charts are incredibly long. Now, we are very lucky. We have the ability to download our computer-aided dispatch, our CAD data, so all our times right into our report. We can upload all our vital signs from our cardiac monitor, and that'll import any invasive monitoring we have going. But even so, these really complex charts where we have you know five or more drips, patients intubated, uh, we've got all kinds of things going on. We're titrating. Like those charts will take us literally hours to complete working as a team. And that's pretty universal throughout the flight world. You're not just pencil whipping these really short narratives, short reports. These things take forever. So just be prepared when you go into flights for things to take longer and for things to just be a little bit more complicated in that aspect. All right. Now, last point but certainly not least, number six, we have to talk about risk. Flights is risky. And anybody that's been in this job any amount of time, like if they've been in this job more than a year, I bet you they can quote a a close call experience they've had on the helicopter. I work for a very safe company. They have a lot of rules and regulations we follow. We've got really good fatigue policy. Um, you know, no pilots aren't pressured to fly. Flight med crew isn't pressured to fly. You, we've got very uh, supportive environment. But even so, you are in a helicopter landing in remote areas where there could be wires or trees. You've got variable weather. You have birds flying everywhere. And Bad things can happen, and they do in the United States every year, multiple times a year. The same partner that moved out to Hawaii, her partner, uh, when they got laid off, her partner got a job at another service out in Hawaii, and a couple weeks later, he ended up dying in a fixed-wing crash uh, into the ocean. So a lot of people have somebody they know that's died in this profession. So I'm not saying you're going to go into this and you're definitely going to die, but there is a risk to flying. And it's really important to consider that when you're looking at the job. You know, we've had people kind of shaken with crashes in the industry. Uh, People have known others that have crashed and it's caused them to leave the profession because they didn't realize the risk was what it was. So there is a risk. Obviously, like I just said, it's not, you know, everybody's just going to die if they do this profession. You just have to be aware of it. If you guys have anything to add to this, if you agree or disagree, please leave them in the comments down below and I will see you next week. 